Uh, over here. Hi, uh, my name's Joe, and I just want to thank the panel for your time and for your insight. And also I want to say thank you, Graham. Um, Boomtown, which is a personal favorite of mine, and that conversation you seem to have, I don't know, it's one of the closest LA crime dramas that I think of that uh, just really captured the city really well. And kind of starting from there in terms of a story question. Are you trying to make me cry? <laughs> <laughs> I'm just saying I listen to your, your commentary a lot when I'm writing. But um, in terms of the conversation you started with Boomtown, too sort of justified, there, there seems to be this tension between justice and righteousness. I mean, I would say that actually justifies two heroes in that, in terms of like you're tracking Boyd alongside Raylan, um, and in terms of that polarity that they seem to both be walking. So in terms of Rachel's shooting, I mean, one of the things that was interesting about the second season is having matriarchy, you know, the feminine energy that's coming into it. And so I guess this is more a question for Wendy and Rachel. In terms of after the shooting has taken place, I, I get the idea that this isn't, you know, this isn't her first time shooting anybody, but in terms of how the impact of basically that, I mean, the guys, you get a sense that Tim, basically it's, it's in his army scout sniper thing. I just compartmentalize and push on. Raylan, I think he's always sort of dealing with it, especially when he shoots someone close to him, which seems to be a lot. <laughs> <laughs> but in terms of Rachel and... <laughs> And sort of dealing with, with sort of that, those issues, I mean, it's, it's sort of interesting because when it's a tangent character, it's like it's got to happen in that episode and it's done. But I was just curious about the, the impact of the shooting upon, you know, that particular character, how she deals with her role in law, in law enforcement, in particular martial enforcement. I decided that that was Rachel's first shooting. Um, I had a conversation with the marshal who served for 25 years and he never shot anyone. And I thought internally what would happen if this was my first shooting, once again, reality versus fantasy. And the choice not to shoot my brother-in-law, which in thinking about that situation, I think Rachel would say, if I see him, it's, it's a wrap. Like, I'm, I'm gonna, I'm, it's, it's me and him, I'm taking him out. And then faced with the reality of that, I chose not to. But the fact that someone went down in the same, in the same scene, having the same opportunity to shoot someone that I actually cared about, I decided that it was, it was my first time and it's something that I believe will stay with me. Whether we see it you know, in a script again or not, it's something that will stay up under there. Yeah. Yeah, for me, I mean, I, one of my favorite things in that scene is her saying, don't shoot, don't shoot, yeah. to Raylan Givens, the man who, when he pulls it, he's going to shoot. You know, and to, uh, to me, that's really powerful. And I also, a really, there's a moment that I pitched really early on, and somehow it made it all the way to the end, which is, you know, I loved your sister, so, so did I. You know, um, she, she would never have gotten to that moment if she had shot him, right? <laughs> um, so I was always thinking about what was going to be the impact of her uh, not shooting, and and especially after having having to kill someone to save the one that you really would like to see have some sort of justice done to them that you could impl you know you could do the impacting on. I don't know. I, for me, it was it was this weird contrast that I thought was really interesting, and I did think it was probably Rachel's first shooting. But I'm actually glad we didn't say that. I'm glad we didn't. Because I feel like a lot of times on, on television shows, the woman is always getting, the, it's her first shooting, and it's this one scene, you know, that there's always that. And I'm glad we didn't go there with it. We just did it. She lets it sit with her, and then we move on. And, and I also really like that, that Raylan has the moment of, you know, asking her, you know, are, are you thinking about this? And the residue of that. I, I tell you, one of the things I'm, I'm actually most proud is, is she gets to do so much action in that last bit but I am so tuned in to how Rayland is reacting to her. And I'm curious about what he's going to carry with him for it. And I think, I think it does, further in the season, as you watch the season, there's, there's something there that happened in this, in this episode that I think that he carries forward with him. And I, I want to add to that, you know, to sort of pat Wendy and Graham on the back in terms of good writing. In my version of Clinton, he wasn't redeeming at all and the choice to not shoot him or to exact revenge was a great gift that they gave Rachel in terms of deepening the complexity of that choice and deepening the understanding of herself um, morally in a situation of heightened emotion. 
So thank you. You're welcome. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Uh, Hi. Um, I just want to say thank you. That was an amazing episode. I really love the comedic tone in Justified. I love how the drug dealer wants to be a magician and these humorous moments just appear at perfect timing. It's just, it's seamless. Um, which is why I want to ask um, Wendy and um, Graham, sorry, Graham. Graham. <laughs> um, other authors you've, I'm so, I, I know your name, I swear, it just went up my um, Other authors you've read over the years who influence your writing, other than Elmer. I'm sorry, what was other, other authors, authors. you've read. I was just, other authors that we like, is that the yeah, that have influenced our writing. Yeah, um, you know, Walter Mosley is an author I just love. And um, we were just, I yeah. just read to him, excuse me, uh, to David. Walter was interviewed in the Los Angeles Times Magazine last December, and they asked him television shows that he liked, and he's, he talked specifically about Justified. I, I almost hit the ceiling. I mean, honestly, <laughs> this is incredible. He loves Justified, because that's a, definitely an author that's had a big influence on me. Um, he'd probably be one of my number ones. What about you? You know, I mean, specifically for a show like this, I do read a lot of, a lot of crime fiction um, and have over the years. And, and I really am drawn to the LA guys, including Walter. And, uh, but going back to Chandler, and, um, and Chan Chandler was a big, had a big impact on Boomtown. Um, so, um, you know, but you know, present day Michael Connolly, Robert Craze, um, I, I do try and keep my, you know, my pulse or get the pulse of what's going on in, in especially LA crime fiction. Thank you. Uh, over here. Thank you. Well, thank you for coming. Um, it's a great show. I'm a huge fan of FX, uh, Sons of Anarchy, kind of. When you guys came up with the tagline for There Is No Box, I was like, all right, it replaced HBO for me. Once the wire went off, it was. That's that's. <laughs> some, you know what I'm saying? I love hearing so that. So Sons of Anarchy was 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 the fix. But that being said, I, I noticed, as with the first season of Sons of Anarchy and the first season of Justified, that especially with with a show like Justified, it's about it's about marshals. So it just by its nature, it has an episodic feel. Fugitive of the week. This is what we have to go get. But I noticed that by the time you got to like the sixth or the seventh or the eighth episode. It got a little bit more uh, uh, serialized with Boyd's story. I noticed that this second season with the, um, I forgot her the name. Bennett. Mags Bennett and her yeah, boys. Yeah, she, need, she needs to get an Emmy off the top, because oh, yeah. she's, whew. Anyway, I noticed that this season is a lot more serialized, and Sons of Anarchy, same thing. It happened around seventh or eighth episode of the first season, and I'm wondering, is that deliberate? Is that? FX guys saying, hey, we need to not... Very perceptive. Yes. <laughs> okay. yes, it is FX. It was John Landgraf who said, we find that it works best if you have standalone episodes for the first bit, and then you can you know, keep your serialized alive, but then get more into that later in the season. And then in the second season, you can sort of move up the, um, the serialization and pay a little more attention to it. The standalone episodes are better to attract an audience. Right. But the um, the serialized stuff uh, rewards the audience, and right. you know the the fans love to see that. You know, it's interesting. The fans, that, it's all for the fans. All, <laughs> that that actually wasn't a strategy necessarily on Sense of Anarchy. That was something that we kind of noticed with that show, which is that the first six had been a little more episodic, because we thought that was what would work. And then naturally, I think people got interested in the serialized storylines, and then. We noticed in terms of the, the ratings response that people sample the first few episodes of a new show. You have people who hear, oh, that's good, I'll check it out. And it's hard to sort of amass an audience, but by episode six, seven, they're coming back more regularly. And yeah, so John asked to replicate that on, on Justified, and you guys did an amazing job at it. So. Okay, great. If I may, a follow up? Sure. Do, um, for Graham and, and Danielle as well, do uh, spec scripts still matter as much as an original pilot? And have you read an original pilot that blew you away so much that maybe you, Graham, were like, all right, who's this person? I got to link up and see if I can move this any further. Yeah. Um, you know, spec scripts, I guess, do still matter. Um, part of the problem with me is I don't, I don't watch a lot of other shows when I'm doing a show because I hate to feel so like, oh, my God, that was really good, and I can't live up to it. 
But so generally, it's, you know, people are reading original pilots, and yeah, I was uh, I was asked to be one of the readers for the WGA diversity program, and you know, you get a script with a title and no name, and just read it. And there was one guy there, um, Sal Calieros, who wrote a script called Big Nowhere, um, set in Alaska, and uh, it blew me away. Yeah, it did. Yeah, I, mean, I, I think there's a there's a tendency more now towards original material. I think that's what it, things seem to like ebb and flow, and that's where it seems to be right now. I think partially because there are so many shows on the air. So if you're getting a spec script, there's a good chance that the person reading it hasn't seen the show. So right. I do read more original than than in specs at this point. And yeah, there there have been times where originals come in and just blow you away, and suddenly you think she would be developing this. Nice. So. Okay, Thank we you. have time for two more questions. Uh, first, I was so excited to see Hey Dude in the list of credits. That was like my favorite wow. show. Oh, it's a little wild and a little oh. strange. Oh. Um, I wanted to be Bradley so bad. Um, and my question is, um, what is y'all's opinion on, and I am from the South, I do say y'all. y'all. You did. I do. Um, on um, the, the, the shows I've worked for, I've been really fortunate. They've actually been fairly diverse in terms of both gender and race, but in the, a lot of obviously a lot of situations where they're not, what are those things that are causing that? Is it just access? Is it um, like a, like different types of aggressiveness in, or like is it, what are the causes of that? Does that make sense? I, I think generally women have not been willing to pay me as much in the meetings when I'm <laughs> meeting them. No, that's, it is being recorded, right? No. Um, <laughs> For uh, archival know, purposes. Yeah, only. It, it's um, <laughs> you know, it's, it's just it's just the material and what feels like the right fit for the show, you know, um, and yet it's trying to keep. Oh, you know, we should have, you know, this person in the room or that, you know. I, it's and again, I, I just felt with Justified that it was so specific, trying to find people who kind of wrote in the arena of Elmore. Um, because it was really tough. I knew how hard it was to just even adapt a short story. And from that point on, we were going to be making up the stories ourselves. And so I was frankly terrified starting the show. Can I ask a super quick follow-up to that? Absolutely not. <laughs> no, of course no, 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 no. Let's go ahead. Um, in terms of that, so when you are creating your own material to send to um, people like yourself, should you try to do something that's more general or something that is just really super specific and hope that it lands or, or try to market it towards the people who also Right that way. Well, I, you know, I, you're not going to write, you know, five different original pilots every year uh, to try and get a job. So, you know, there's only so many you're going to write. Although, as Danielle said, it's good to be prolific. You know, you got to write what you love to write, and that 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 shows through. You know, it's just you, you can just feel it. Oh, this person loves this kind of story, and loves these characters, and that's that really counts for a lot. And ha having a voice really is what what makes people stand out. Is when you when you feel like there's something real and original and, and just there and, and a voice there. So yeah, write what you care about. Write what you love. Oh, thank you. Well, thank you. Well, thank you, David. Yes. <laughs>